There's a good reason for that though. In the opening 20 minutes of the race, I had an NP of nearly 400 watts. And by the way, 400 watts is the highest power I've ever seen for 20 minutes, meaning that I had essentially done a 20 minute FTP test effort at the start of a four hour race. Welcome back to the channel. This video is fueled by the feed. If you consume cycling content on YouTube, then there's no doubt that you've seen some hot tech and race report videos from the Sea Otter Classic pop up on your feed. Also, apparently even GCN is sending their presenters over here to do the racing, which may be a sign that the Lifetime Grand Prix has gotten big enough that it needs no introduction. Well, I mean, GCN also just made their 40th video about what clothing to wear when you ride a bike, so I wouldn't necessarily take their struggle to find new content as an indication that people actually care about these cute little gravel races you're doing. In case you are unfamiliar though, Sea Otter's Marathon Mountain Bike Race is the first race of the Lifetime Grand Prix, which is the US's premier professional off-road cycling series. The race is 67 miles or 108 kilometers, and the course consists of pretty consistent punchy climbs that can last from three to five minutes, with the biggest climb of the day right at the end of the lap, and you hit that twice as it's a two lap race. Yeah, after nearly 70 miles on a mountain bike, this part right here sucks a lot. The terrain is a mix of single track, double track, and gravel that can be fairly smooth and fast, but after a rainy winter here in Monterey, California, the course was actually relatively bumpy and littered with rain ruts, which meant you had to stay on your toes throughout the race, as it's pretty easy to get caught out. As for the competition, well, it's a lifetime Grand Prix race, so of course this race included nearly all of the fastest off-road racers in the country and beyond as more and more international riders flock to the series. It really does not get more stacked at a US mountain bike race than this. The bike I rode for this race was the Allied BC40, which, as you may have noticed, is not a felt. So what gives, Dylan? I thought you were sponsored by felt. Well, Felt doesn't currently make a mountain bike, which means that us on the Felt United team are free to use other brands for our mountain bike races, which for me will primarily just be the three mountain bike races included in the Lifetime Grand Prix. Allied set me up with this bike and even did this custom paint job for me, which came out beautifully in my opinion. For those who follow me on Strava, no, that's not a very nice ride sticker. That's actually part of the paint. I think you're getting a little carried away with this inside joke, man. I mean, it was funny at first, but now it's just overused and getting old. If you were expecting drop bars on this bike, don't worry, that is likely coming in the near future, but not for this race. Even if it's not an overly technical race by mountain bike race standards, Sea Otter still has plenty of actual mountain bike trail on the course that normal mountain bike bars are still going to be faster on in my opinion. That being said, the bars on this bike are still probably one of the most eye-catching features of the bike. They're the Gemini Propus bar stem combo, and this bar stem weighs in at a ridiculous 150 grams. Yes, you heard that right, weight weenies, 150 grams for the bar and stem. This helps get the overall build down to 22 and a half pounds or 10 kilos, and that's with a dropper post, pedals, and bottle cages. Lastly, the tires I ran for this race were the Schwalbe Racing Ralph Super Ground 2.35s with a ridiculously low 15 PSI in the front and 16 PSI in the rear with no tire inserts. There just isn't a whole lot to puncture on on this course, so I took that risk. The reason for the low pressure is both for improved traction in the sandy corners on the course and reduced rolling resistance on the bumpy terrain. I had played around with the faster sibling of these tires, the Thunderbird, which has actually become one of my favorite tires for gravel racing in the 2.1 width, but for mountain biking, I just wasn't getting enough traction out of them in the corners, and there are a lot of corners on this course, and if you're losing a quarter of a second in every corner, that can really add up over the course of a 70-mile race. All right, on to the race itself, and let's start by addressing the start. If you watched my video from last year's Sea Otter, you may remember the colossal blunder of going solo right off the line in an attempt to get the whole shot 
into the single track. In my defense, we're only on the wide track for about 90 seconds before we funnel into nearly 15 minutes of single track where passing is close to impossible, meaning that getting a good position at the start is critical and could actually make or break your entire race. You won't win Sea Otter in the first 90 seconds, but you can absolutely lose it. Two years ago, we went as hard as we possibly could from the second the gun went off all the way until we hit the single track, and I just assumed we were going to do the same thing again, but clearly I was wrong. I ended up going off the front and then being caught and passed by nearly 50 riders with just 30 seconds in the climb remaining. I was obviously not going to make that mistake again. This year, I found myself lined up right behind Tobin Ortenblatt, which, as you may remember, was the rider who I was also right behind at Schwamigan last year, who decided to crash himself out in the first 30 seconds of the race, so this is already a real smart move on my part to be anywhere near him. I'm just kidding. Tobin is a great rider, but with his level of experience, he does deserve a little sh for this move at Schwamigan last year, and he's done the same to me for my move at Sea Otter last year. I mean, the dude looks like he drinks liquid horse testosterone for breakfast, and you, well, you look like a cyclist, so maybe just cool it on the snarky comments, huh? We got off the line cleanly, no major crashes or pile-ups, and similar to last year, we waited until the final pitch in the last 30 seconds to really drop the hammer. Now, I say that, but the first minute was done at 474 watts, and then in the final 30 seconds, we ramped that up to over 700 watts, making for an average of 532 watts in the first two minutes of the race. And I have to say that when we hit the final pitch, I was holding absolutely nothing back, and I had imagined that no one in the field was at this point. We all knew how critical the starting position was, so we threw everything we had at getting the best position possible. I entered the single track about 20 to 25 riders back, and with Keegan Swenson on the front setting the pace, I knew gaps were going to form in this opening single track section. It would just be a question of whether or not they'd be closable when we exited. I felt decent at first, but then on the final pitch of the first single track before we hit gravel, I felt myself losing contact with the front group, which is not a good spot for this to happen. There's a good reason for that though. In the opening 20 minutes of the race, I had an NP of nearly 400 watts. And by the way, 400 watts is the highest power I've ever seen for 20 minutes, meaning that I had essentially done a 20-minute FTP test effort at the start of a four-hour race. Mine's 410. As you may have noticed, my pacing strategy, or really lack thereof, is completely different to the one I talked about in my Leadville video from last year, where I just let the front group go immediately and then rode at a pace that I knew was sustainable for me. There's multiple reasons for this, but I'd say the biggest is that drafting plays some role in this race with wide open flat gravel sections throughout the course, and getting in a fast group is important. Not that drafting doesn't matter at Leadville, but at least for me, at 10 to 12,000 feet of elevation, the risk of catastrophically blowing up is just too great. Stick around to the end of the video because I will be comparing these two strategies and giving my opinion on whether or not the Leadville strategy could actually work for this race. All of that said, I did check myself on this first lap of Sea Otter and didn't continue to just keep pushing into the red until very bad things started to happen. On the last pitch of that first single track climb, I did lose contact with that front group and found myself working with a group of chasers, including the likes of Lachlan Morton, Taylor Ledeen, and Torbjorn Road. You may remember Torbjorn from my Mid-South video, he's the dude that freaking won the thing. That being said, they were still not riding at a pace that I thought I could hold. In fact, in the first hour of the race as I attempted to stay with them, I had to do 360 watts NP. Mind you, my FTP is around 370, maybe 380, so again, this is unsustainable and a further adjustment needed to be made. Finally, around the hour mark, as I let those riders go, I was able to get my pace under control at just 302 watts for the next 40 minutes. During this time, I found myself working with Matthew Morado and Dan English. On that final climb of the first lap, I did 344 watts NP for over 18 minutes, with these two riders still with me, but I noticed that a rather large group of about six or seven guys 
was not far behind, and it was looking like this group would likely join us for the second lap. Sure enough, in the opening single track section of the second lap, they made the catch with Cody Cup leading the charge. In that opening single track section, we rolled at 324 watts NP for 24 minutes, and it is around this point that I started to wonder how much these guys really have left in the tank. I felt like I didn't burn all of my matches in the first lap, but you never know on such a punchy course. Last year, towards the end of the race, I started cramping after basically doing repeated VO2 max efforts over and over and over again for four hours. And predictably, we started catching riders right and left as they dropped from the front group. We probably started the lap battling for 25th spot, and with half a lap left to go, we were now probably in sight of the top 20. Keeping on the gas, we never let the NP drop below 300, but then as we hit some of the long gravel sections towards the latter half of the lap, I noticed that this group, which had about 10 riders, including the likes of Pete Stetna, Tobin Ortenblad, Kyle Trudeau, and others, just stopped doing much work, or at least when somebody did pull through, it was a very light pull. This could only mean one thing, considering that this wasn't a front group that could have been playing tactical games with each other. The riders in this group were spent. Knowing this, I accelerated hard when it was my turn to pull. I wouldn't even really call it an attack, but just that effort alone was enough to almost immediately get a gap. After seeing this, I decided to just put my head down and go solo. No point in staying with a group this late into the race, especially if they're a spent force anyway. Over the next 40 minutes, I rolled at 307 watts NP on a section of the course that actually had a lot of double track and gravel. However, coming into the last climb, one rider from the group behind did manage to catch me, and that rider was Braden Lang. He established a small gap that I was unable to close at this point in the race, and on that final climb, 311 watts for 19 minutes and change, was all I could muster, and I was fully pinned at that power too, with a carrot in front of me in the form of Braden to chase, and Pete Stetna breathing down my neck just 20 seconds behind. Fortunately, I was able to hold off Pete though, and come in for a 20th place finish on the day in a time of 4 hours, 13 minutes, and 46 seconds, which is about 13 and a half minutes down on the winner, who I'm sure you could probably guess was Keegan Swenson. For those that don't follow American off-road racing, this is our match Vanderpool. For many of the GP courses, the dude seems practically unbeatable, and I will say that only being 13 minutes down on him in a four-hour period actually did feel pretty good. In fact, even though 20th place doesn't necessarily seem like a stellar result, it was a huge improvement for me as I finished 30th last year in a time that was 14 minutes slower with a power output that was 18 watts lower. And of course, there was the whole start debacle that put me on the back foot from the beginning. Speaking of watts, let's talk about some of the stats from this race. For the entire race, I had an NP of 322 and an average power of 267. 163 average heart rate and 180 max, 16 miles per hour or 25 kilometers per hour average speed, 320 TSS, and over 4,000 kilojoules. I do want to take a minute to discuss the pacing though. My first lap had an NP of 339 watts and a time of 2 hours and 3 minutes, while my second lap slowed down to 303 NP and 2 hours and 10 minutes. As I said at the top of the video, this is in stark contrast to my Leadville strategy, which was extremely well paced, but required a lot of trust and patience on my part. At the top of the first climb at Leadville, I was probably as far back as 50th place, but by the end, I made my way up to 17th. This is by far the preferred pacing strategy if the race was a solo time trial, but then of course you have to take into account the effect of drafting, and if you did pace yourself properly, you would be in last place going into the first single track section and hit some major bottlenecks and lose a huge chunk of time. Still, it could be possible to do the start all out just like everyone else to establish a good position and then immediately back it down to a sustainable pace once you hit the single track. Other than pissing off all the riders behind you, I am open to the possibility that this may actually lead to a faster overall finishing time, and is something that perhaps I should experiment with at Sea Otter in the future. You're really not that smart, bro. Going balls to the wall at the start and then pissing off riders behind me has been my go-to strategy since day one. Finally, as far as where this puts me in the overall, I have slotted right back into 17th place in the Grand Prix standings. I know, it's as if I'm destined to live in that 16th to 17th place spot. 
for those that don't know, I finished 16th in the series in 2022 and 16th in the series in 2023. Despite my improvement over the past three years since the Grand Prix started, the rest of the competition seemingly has only improved as well. I do wonder when the GP is going to hit a plateau in progression, but if that point exists, we still haven't hit it yet. For now though, I am very happy with where my fitness is at. Seeing this kind of improvement is extremely motivating and makes me think that maybe I haven't quite hit my genetic ceiling just yet, but Stay tuned to see how the rest of the season progresses. Thanks for watching. If you want to follow my racing closer in real time, be sure to check me out on Instagram. And if you enjoyed this video, be sure to give it a like, subscribe, and share it with your cycling friends. I'll see you in the next one.